Uh, I'm going to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we are going to begin it in verse 1. These rocks, each week during Lent, have represented different things uh, for us as we brought them to the cross. But I think, above all, I can't help when I hold the weight of the stone in my hand. I can't help but think of the sin in my life. And probably each week that's more or less where your thoughts have gone to. Uh, the rebellion, the sin, the choices that I need forgiveness from my Savior for as we come to the cross. And, and these are really for you uh, to write on them, to sketch on them, leave them blank, whatever you want, so that when communion time comes, uh, we want to invite you to bring these up front lay them at the cross, and then come by and get uh, the body and the blood, the bread and the juice. Uh, so you do with these as you want, because stones play into our story quite a bit this morning. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Have any, any of you been to a desert? Uh, maybe half of you to a desert? I had my first desert experience uh, a year and a half ago. We went out west, and it is beautiful. Uh, driving through there, uh, we saw those like stereotypical saguara cacti. Uh, we have some great pictures with those things. Uh, there is beauty in the creatures that were running around the canyons that we drove through. But rest assured, every time I saw a trip coming that was going to take us through a desert, can you guess what I did before we ever got to the desert? Filled up with gas and made sure we all had some drink. Because the desert of all the places on God's good earth that I do not ever want to be stranded, it's the desert. The desert in Jesus' day is similar. It's dry. It's fairly barren. And to think that Jesus is led by the Spirit into the desert is interesting because many of you pray that you want to be led by the Spirit. I pray that same prayer. God, may you guide me by your Spirit. May you empower me. Just please, not the desert. Like, anywhere, God, except not there. In fact, in the book of Mark, it's not being led by the Spirit. Mark uses a word that means driven by the Spirit. Meaning, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is part of the Trinity, the eternal Godhead. And the Holy Spirit drives Jesus into the desert. Why would he do that? His ministry is beginning. He's been baptized. God had, the Father had some amazing words over the Son. At the baptism, he spoke, This is my Son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. I love Jesus and I'm going to send him to the deserts. Man, it's not a place that you choose to go on your own. Some of you may be in that place this morning. The very place that you would never choose to go on your own, you don't understand why, but God has driven you there. Maybe it's a place of loneliness. Or maybe it's a place of financial fear. Or maybe it's a place even of temptation. That you didn't choose it, but here you are. And you're facing your desert. Maybe it's within your own marriage. Maybe your work is ebbing away. In the desert, one thing that happens is everything that we once held dear is stripped away. There is no chocolate in the desert. In the desert, in the place that you might be this morning, you're left with 
three things. Other than God, you're left with yourself, you're left with the temptation, and you're left with the tempter. And that's a scary, sketchy place to be. Because terrible things can happen in that place where it's you, the temptation, and a tempter. Terrible things can happen. And I want to assure you, blessed things can happen in that same moment, too. It's also an opportunity for incredible growth in faith. One theologian wrote this. I love it. She wrote, In the desert, the extras of life are stripped away. When we follow Jesus into the desert, we begin to acknowledge that our life is not, nor ever will be, completely under our control. In the desert, the pillars of human comfort, pleasure, and possession are smashed. One feels powerless, miles away from sources of immediate gratification. The owner of little or nothing of material value. One cannot barter one's way out of loneliness and silence. One can only wait until it passes on the wings of faith and hope. Where are you at this morning? Where are you at as you come in to worship God this morning? This morning, Are you in that place of loneliness that your desert is just lonely? Are you lonely in your marriage? Are you sweaty, just working hard, and sweat is pouring out and nothing seems to be progressing? The desert's full of danger. Freaked me out to know there are things slithering around my feet out there. I'm not a snake guy. Uh, to overcome that, just to go take pictures with the guy. All my man card, lay down on the table. Because the desert's a scary place to be, too. It's dangerous. Are you hovering this morning around things that are really dangerous to you? Things that you know God said, no, they're not good for you. And yet you're looking in, you think they might be. The desert seems like it never ends. Just one sand dune after another. Does that describe your life this morning? Are you in that place where you can relate to Jesus being driven into the desert alone? Think with me, just for a moment. Where is the place that God fashions most of his men in the Bible? Isn't it amazing when you think about it? Moses in the desert. Abraham in the desert. Jesus in the desert. David gets fashioned in the desert. It's hot and empty, but it's also a place where it's quiet. Verse 2. After fasting, 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Do you think Jesus was really hungry? Yes. He's starving. Just like you would be fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's literally hungry. He would eat anything like you would after being without food for 40 days. He's hungry. Verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Here's a truth in life I found that I think you probably have found too. Temptations do not come to your strengths, do they? They come to your weaknesses. The very places that you struggle, that you fall, that you tend to sin, those are the places that the temptations come strong. The places where you're strong, where God has sanctified you and strengthened you, and you have lots of faith and obedience... The temptations don't tend to hang out there. They're at the place where you're weak. And Jesus is hungry. And I don't know what your theology is, but I hope you heard Esther mention it briefly. Was Jesus tempted to do this? Yes. Yes. Jesus was tempted to in every way, just as you and I. You see, it's not a sin to be tempted. 
It's not sinful to go without food for 40 days to have Satan come and say, hey, you could probably turn that stone into bread and to let it process through your mind, wow, I could, and man, am I hungry. That is not a sin. I want to release you. Temptation is not a sin. It is not a sin to be tempted. Otherwise, we don't serve a perfect Savior because He was tempted, Hebrews tells us, in every way, just as we are. Jesus is literally tempted to do this. But he doesn't. He fights it. Even though he's weak, and even though the missiles fly here, he doesn't give in. James chapter 1 says, When tempted, let your mind go there. When James is talking, he's talking to you. Where are you tempted? Where do these times come in your life? What do they look like? When tempted... No one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And there's the hook. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The beginning of the equation is not sinful. But after it creates a desire and the hook is in your heart and you start getting pulled in and desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin and sin leads to death. Lent, the six Sundays before Easter, is a time for God's church to reflect a little deeper in some of these areas. It's a time for us to confront our sins, the temptations that the tempter has given to us, to recognize a need that I must die to myself. There is no other way to find salvation other than to die to myself so that Christ might live in me. And I think it's in the deserts of life that that can truly happen. It's in the deserts of life that God does his most amazing work in us. Jesus is offered to turn stones into bread. I've read some of your stones. Hopefully you guys have seen them over the weeks. We made a decision early on that we would clear out the stones each week because when we confess our sin, God is really just and faithful. And he forgives our sins. And so we pondered, do we bring the stones back? Do we do something with them? And at the end of the day, we said, no. We heard it this morning, right? Uh, God washes our crimson stain white like wool. He erases sin. He accepts our repentance. He forgives. He cleans. He washes. And so we decided that we didn't want to keep bringing the stones back every week. When you lay them up, they're done. They're gone. Many of you have expressed some of these same thoughts that I need a Savior, I need forgiveness, Lord, help. Each week during Lent, stones have helped us identify and confess our sin as we go week to week. And it's fairly ironic. We exchange the stone for bread. Interesting, isn't it? We lay down our stone, and the next thing we do so we pick up some bread in a cup. Because somehow we know, we know that Jesus' bread, his body, his death, satisfies our spiritual hunger. The man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The New Testament begins to call Jesus later on the Word. The Word. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And then listen to what Jesus, the Word, says in John chapter 6. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Well, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, 
You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. And it's like all the Old Testament and all the stories right back to the Passover and the deliverance from Egypt when God gives manna to his people is all of it pointing to one day, one day you'll be satisfied forever. One day you'll have a bread that will not ever disappear. It will satisfy every spiritual hunger you have. And Jesus is saying that day has come. That day is me, my death, and ultimately my resurrection. See, when you swap your stone, the sin in our lives, when we lay it at the cross and we get the body and the blood of Jesus, it's a meal, friends, that feeds you into eternity. It's an eternal meal that God wants fellowship with sinners like us. That God loves you. That he wants a relationship with you. That he wants to sit at a wedding banquet with you forever. This bread, the word that comes from the Father, is the bread on which the church feeds. And God offers that kind of bread to all of us. To you. No matter what your story is, that you would come under his rule and into relationship with him. And finally, it seems like that swap from stones to bread is a requirement. A requirement for us. I mean, we all want to swap our, our stone for the bread that feeds us eternally. I don't want to carry my sin into eternity. Picture it this way with me. If there is an eternity which I think that there's lots of reasons to believe that. Scripture certainly teaches there is an eternity. But I think even looking at the world around us and our thoughts and desires, we can extrapolate, if we're not prejudiced against the idea, that there is an eternity out there. It's not a far-fetched idea. If you buy into that, you would rather bring Jesus' body into that eternity, feeding on that rather than bringing your stone. Given the choice. I don't want my sin because I don't think that's going to be a good picture. I'd like Jesus' righteousness. I would like to hear the words God spoke over him. You are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased that that's what I want for all of eternity. Not my sin because I know where that goes. That's the action we've been taking this season. Swapping our stone, our sin, and holding Jesus' sacrificed body in our hands because he's paid our debt. Jesus has offered you forgiveness. And somehow we know that's good news. We celebrate it. We sing about it. We come out each week to celebrate God has done something amazing for us in Jesus. There's another swap. This is probably mundane, but here it is. Our family really enjoys skiing, okay? Most of our family really enjoys skiing. And for those of you who have skied, you know the best part of the day is the end of the day when you take your ski boots off and you put your sneakers back on because that's amazing, that swap. Or if you're outside in the rain all day, and it's cold, and you finally come inside, what's the first thing you do? You swap out it into dry clothes. You exchange something you don't want for something you want. And after a week in the desert, after a week living the life that you just lived these past seven days, there is an exchange that God offers to you. That He will take your sin at the cross, and He will give you life through his son at the table. It's an amazing offer that he gives to us. 
But oftentimes, we sit in that same place Jesus was in. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And we say, I am lonely. And the temptation offered to me sounds like it's going to cure my loneliness. Man, I really did get hurt. And the temptation out there to just be angry and be bitter towards someone, that sounds like it's going to make me feel good and satisfy me. And this relationship that I know should be forbidden, it sounds good and I think it might satisfy me. And we say, sure, I'll make that swap. And we think we're swapping our need for something that's going to satisfy. When, if we could just see the reality of it, all we're doing is listening to the devil's temptation. That he has a way that's better than God to satisfy your need. That he has a way that's better than God to satisfy your hunger. That he has a way that's better than God's to meet your deepest heartfelt needs. You've been there. Because I've been there. I know that place well. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray something about bread. The Lord's Prayer is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. God, may you satisfy the needs I have today. God, would you meet my deepest need that I'm offering to you today? God, may I trust that your bread is the eternal satisfaction. And may you give that to me in a way that's going to satisfy my heart. It's no surprise to me. What follows that is, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation. Because God, I want your sustenance. I need you to provide here, right now. Because I'm so tempted to turn that stone into bread. I'm so tempted to listen that there's a better way. I'm so tempted to dive into that relationship. I'm so tempted to be bitter and gossip about that individual. I'm so tempted to go to places I shouldn't go. God, give me your daily bread today, right here, right now, because I'm desperate for it. But I want you to listen further, and this is where we're going to close. Right after he teaches... His disciples how to pray the very next verse. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Have you ever heard that taught? I hope I've taught it from the pulpit. I'm not sure I've made that clear. That as we exchange, God, you take my sin, and I'm so thankful for Jesus. We do not have a choice then to say, but who's, whoever owes me a debt, I'm not going to cancel it. I choose not, not to forgive. According to Jesus, that is not an option. Because if we withhold forgiveness from a brother or a sister... They hurt me too bad. They haven't done the right things. They continue to do it. And when we withhold forgiveness, Jesus says as clearly as he can, your Father will not forgive your sins. I want to encourage you. Some of you have relationships within your family that you need to work on forgiving. Some of you have people in your family you haven't talked to in a decade because you've held on to something that long and there's a broken relationship. Some of you, maybe it's with a neighbor, a co-worker, maybe it's someone within our church that you have withheld forgiveness and at the same time figured everything would be okay with you as you come and swap your stone for bread. For some of you, I think, this morning your stone is not necessarily just your sin, but it's representing letting go and forgiving something that's been done to you. When we come 
to eat this bread. The Bible clearly teaches we come with empty hands to receive. When we come with grudges, when we come holding someone else hostage because of what they've done to us, we go back to the desert with Jesus and we tell the devil, yes, I'll listen to your way because God's way doesn't seem like it's going to be satisfactory to me. And that bitterness makes my heart feel pretty good in the moment. We come with open hands. Some of you may think even as I say that, I can't let go. You have no idea what's been done to me. I don't, for many of you. Some of you think, if I don't hold them accountable, who else will? How can I let them get off with what they did to me? And let me just say, there's a cross and a Savior exactly for what they did to you. The accountability is not yours to seek. It's God's. And he has sought it. And he laid it on his son on a cross. Who died for them as much as he died for you. Let me encourage you. Spend the time you need in prayer. With your rock. With your marker. With nothing. It doesn't matter. But when you come up to communion. I want you to come open handed. Not holding on to the grudges. Not withholding forgiveness from others that need it. From you. This is our fifth Sunday of Lent. I guess the question we're faced with is at the end of the day, will you look for the shortcut to feeling good? Just listening to the temptation and falling for it. Will you listen to the shortcut to feeling good? Trading our stone for bread that the devil offers so that we can feel good or somehow refreshed or Are you authentically, earnestly seeking forgiveness by God who loves you deeply? And if you're looking for the real thing, your stone may represent a grudge or or an offense that has happened to you that you lay down and say, I will not hold them accountable any longer. In the name of Jesus, I forgive. And it may be a week for a phone call, a letter, face to face. It might have to happen. The summary of it is forgiven people need to forgive. Forgiven people need to forgive. This isn't just for you. This has a lot to do with our relationships around us. I want to encourage you to spend the time you need as we move to communion. You can write down a name, initials, if that's you, whatever you want to do. And then lay it down as we trust God to provide for us in our deserts. Let me pray and then... uh, I think we have our uh, background movie ready to go. Father, we come before you. You are the one who stood strong. You are the righteous one. And you were tempted just like us. But Jesus, you fully learned to trust your Father. And God, I pray that you would open our minds to know God more. That we could trust He is the best dad ever. And that when he speaks to us, he has our good in mind. Lord, help us to avoid the temptation to go elsewhere to seek satisfaction. In the places that we are tempted, God, may you give us strength through your word and by the power of the Holy Spirit to stand and say no. And God, you know our hearts this morning. We give permission for the Holy Spirit to have his work among us as we swap our stones for the living bread. As we lay down not just our offenses, but offer forgiveness to others that we've been holding hostage. Lord, may you free your people at FCCB this morning. In Jesus' name we pray.